So the bell has chimed. Dear students, colleagues and friends, uh, as a Dean at the School of Business Economics and Law at the University of Gothenburg, uh, I feel both proud and honored of that we have been entrusted to host a Kampuszynski Development Lecture, a so-called CAP Talk. And this is a joint initiative of the European Commission, the United Nations Development Programme and our school. The CAP Talk honor the name of Richard Kapuczynski, who was a Polish journalist who was path breaking through his articles and books describing the develop, developing world. And Kapuscinski's writings have made a great deal of impression on many of us within the school. And uh, there is a very clear relationship between what he wrote and what we do today in research and education in areas such as development economics, international trade, areas that constitute strongholds at the school. And therefore, I felt it to be a perfect match when I was contacted sometime this summer uh, by Jan Shensky at UNDP uh, with a question, would you be willing to host a CAP talk in Gothenburg? And now we are here. And with that said, I leave the stage for Annika Weppling. Deputy Head of the European Commission representative in Sweden, please, Annika, one of the joint collaborators. Thank you. No. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I've said it a couple of times very silently. Uh, but I would like to thank the University of Gothenburg and the United Nations Development Programme for working together with us to bring us all together. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at this Kapuczynski Development lecture, lecture. And as was said, this is, I mean, the, the Kapuczynski Lectures, it's, it's an initiative that the European Commission has been running together with the UNDP since 2009. And also, of course, a very special thank you to Beata Javodcik for joining us here today. Uh, I look very much forward to hearing you, uh, your presentation or your, um, your lecture on how the world recovers from the economic pains of the pandemic and whether it does so with a new approach. Today's theme, globalization after the COVID, business as usual or not, cannot be more timely. We are starting to see the impact that the pandemic has had on our world, but let's not forget that also the ongoing Russian aggression war against Ukraine will have an impact. We are seeing the horrors, we are seeing the horrific pictures and, and, and uh, coming from Ukraine and affecting the people living there and the impact it has on their lives. But this impact is also on the European Union, but it will for sure also be on the whole world globally. It will aggrav aggravate the pressure on food security, on food systems and on energy. So we can be sure that we are heading into some very turbulent times. We can also recognize that these challenging times, being it the COVID-19 pandemic and now also with the war, has shown that Europe is able to stand together and to remain united, even in crisis situations. Since 2020, and in the face of the pandemic, the EU and its member states agreed to work as closely as possible in what we call Team Europe approach, joining forces to, to tackle global challenges. Team Europe brings together the European Union, the member states and their financial institutions, as well as the European Investment Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Together we have mobilized some 46 billion euro in the form of humanitarian aid, support to crucial, crucial sectors such as health and food, and the overall social economic uh, systems. 
We bring forward joint large scale projects to promote a sustainable recovery. And we're doing this in line with the with the Agenda 2030, so the UN Sustainability Pro um, Agenda, and also, of course, with the Paris Agreement on Climate. In short, if we are looking at how Europe recovers from the economic pains of the pandemic, and whether it does so with a new approach, which is to quote the lecture of today, then we can conclude that we are, in fact, witnessing some kind of shift in the way Europe engages with the world. It is a more coordinated and hopefully more impactful foreign policy that means a stronger European approach and hopefully also a stronger European global player. With that, I would like to thank you and pass back to you. Thank you very much, Annika. And uh, let us also hear from the third party of this CapTalk joint venture, the UNDP. And I therefore invite uh, Jan Shinsky to Take the stage, please, Jan. Thank you very much. Thank you much, uh, very much, uh, Per and uh, Professor Javotik for accepting the, the invitation. Here, it's great to be here for the first time with the Kapuscinski Development Lectures in Gothenburg, and uh, um, I hope not the last. Um, it's uh, it's great to be here with uh, as well with our friends, uh, strategic friends from from the from the European Commission. Um, it's uh, the, the, the aim of this series of lectures is to raise awareness uh, about development, but more broadly about uh, global, uh, global challenges and global issues. Uh, today, uh, to date, uh, since uh, 2009, we've organized over 130 of these uh, events where we actually can meet uh, students with interesting experts for the last two years. We did also a lot of online events, uh, but that's a completely different story. And, and we're happy to, to be slowly back in uh, with the on-site events and actually having this networking and, uh, and, uh, and meeting. Uh, as I said, the aim is to raise awareness, but also to, to as one of our uh, previous uh, speakers, uh, Jan van der Mortele said, actually in, in, uh, at the lecture in Stockholm, um, that the idea is also to challenge the conventional wisdom that we have uh, and uh, about development and, and uh, tackling the, the, uh, the global issues. And of course, at, at, at it was, as it was said here, the, the, the topic is, is very important about the impact of uh, the enormous socioeconomic impact of, of COVID. Um, especially on the poorest, uh, uh, poorest nations, uh, but also, I mean, it's 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 obvious that we have not yet recovered from from COVID, and we have new uh, new challenges and uh, and uh, um, severe impacts that it's difficult to assess yet of the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, so we, we we would be uh, very much interested to hear from Professor Yavorczyk about the the both assessment and also recommendations for for recovery uh, in these uh, turmoil uh, times. Um, I would like to also mention that we have an online audience, so we uh, I hope we might get some some questions and discussion as well from uh, from the online audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. At present, we are experiencing a world situation in which a combination of developments challenge the short and long term sustainability of our societies. Uh, we have the breakdown of hopes for a European peace order brought about by an armed aggression violating fundamental international law. We have an increased awareness of the existential threats that accrue from climate change and shrinking biodiversity. We have an increased awareness of the fragility of international supply chains on which we depend. And moreover, we also at the same time have an erosion of multilateral structures for international cooperation and a rise of regionalism and bilateralism. And in this context, we are entering the process of recreating transnational cooperation in a post pandemic setting. This is certainly a challenge, but it may be also a window of opportunity. 
And this is the focus of the CAP talk that is now about to start. Globalization after COVID, business as usual or not. And um, it is with great pleasure that I welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Beata Javorczyk, Chief Economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the EBRD. A position she holds while on leave from her professorship uh, in economics at Oxford University, where she is also a fellow of All Souls College. Professor Javorczyk's presentation will be followed by an open discussion where you are all invited to participate from the auditorium, through the question and answer mechanism within the Zoom room, or by using Twitter at hashtag CapTalks. This, the discussion will be led by my colleague, Professor Ola Olsson. And uh, just before we start, according to the GDPR, I have to alert you on that there are photographers present in this room. And if you do not want to be caught in a picture that could be published, you have to just raise your hand now. I think we are all fine. Thank you very much. And uh, Professor Javorczyk, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am humbled by this very generous uh, introduction and I'm very thrilled to be here. So huge thanks to the commission, to UNDP and to the university and of course, to all of you for coming here. I'm particularly honored to take part in the in a cup talk, being Polish, uh, it's an honor to speak in a lecture series that honors my compatriot. But I also would like to say a few words about Kapuściński. Um, you may think this is somebody who was writing uh, reports from the developing world a long time ago, and therefore these reports are no longer relevant to you actually nothing could be further from truth. Um, his book, The Emperor, which was extremely well known around the world, it, a book about the Ethiopian emperor Haile Selassie, is more and more relevant by the day. It's not a book about Ethiopia. It is a book about dictators, about how people don't speak truth to dictators and how it is inevitable that dictators become isolated and detached from reality and how it can lead to detrimental consequences for their country and beyond. And, and I think this is what we are facing sadly today in the world. But let's move on to globalization. So I'm going to talk about globalization after COVID, but actually perhaps a better title for this talk would be globalization in turbulent times. And I will argue that it is no longer business as usual when it comes to globalization. And there are several reasons for that. The first, the state is back. We've seen the return of the state. And you may think that this is something that's just happening due to COVID. That is not true. Actually, the state, the state involvement in the economy has been on the rise for uh, the past two decades. Second, if we have been uh, experiencing incredible disruptions to supply chains. They are not going away anytime soon. And they are going to have implications for geography of trade because of increased focus on resilience. And third, um, we are at a very pivotal moment when it comes to energy security, when it comes to green transition, and this is also going to have implications for globalizations. And actually, it is not unlikely that these three trends are going to lead to scaling back of globalization. On the positive side, we have new ways of working, remote work, digitalization, and that's something that can lead to increased exports of services from emerging markets. So this will be a partially counterbalancing force. So return of the state. 
Um, during the pandemic, uh, in August 2020, the EBRD did a survey in several countries asking people whether they themselves of me or members of their families have lost a job due to COVID. And interestingly, I mean, not surprisingly, you see the blue bars are higher than the red bars in the emerging markets people faced greater job losses, and that's simply because government intervention, government spending was lower than in developed countries. But what's particularly striking here is that Belarus was the country with the lowest job losses. Why is that? Well, that's because that's the country where three quarters of total employment uh, is due to the state. So 50% of people are employed in state-owned enterprises and another quarter is employed um, in the public sector. And if you look at these blue bars of state and employment in state enterprises, you see that Belarus is extreme, but there are many other countries, many emerging markets, which have significant shares of employment in the state sector. Um, in the 1990s, we thought that we reached the end of history, that, you know, capitalism won, communists lost, and we were on a path to democracy, privatization, and we would no longer see state-owned enterprises. And indeed, you see on one of the graphs that employ share of public employment in total employment um, in post-communist countries, that's this red line, it has gone from, you know, mid about half in mid 1990s um, to about a quarter in 2018. But it still remains significantly above the average found in advanced economies or in other emerging markets. And as you see in the scatter plot, you see the, the sort of little red dots in post communist countries, public employment remains seven percentage points higher than in other economies with the same level of income. Now, why should we care, right? Well, we should care because people care about public employment. People care about the role of the state in the economy. Um, in this graph, you see responses to world values surveys. So these are surveys which ask people, are you in favor of greater role of the state in firms and in industry? And the dashed line shows responses um, 20 years ago, and the solid line shows responses right uh, before COVID, three years before COVID. And you see that for people of different cohorts, so people born in different years, um, are uniform in being moderately uh, favorably um, predisposed towards state playing a greater role in the economy. So this is, these are statistics for advanced countries. Moreover, you see that this positive view of the role of the state in the economy has increased over the last 20 years. Now let's look at post-communist countries. Here, people are even more positive about the state. And these are the countries where you saw public employment going down over the last three decades. At the same time, people have become more positive, more favorably predisposed to the state playing a greater role in the economy. Now, in emerging markets, um, the figure is even larger. Now, note that this is not due to generational change. So it's not that, you know, young people think differently than old people. There is some of that. But actually, you see within people born with in the same year within that cohort people are changing their minds they have changed their minds over the last 20 years now if history is any guide we are going to see this trend continuing now what economists do is they use this little trick um, they look at people's experiences during their formative years so based on when you were born where you lived we know whether you were exposed to a crisis or to an epidemic when you were between 18 and 25 this is roughly considered the years when people's views of the world are shaped and then you can see these people later on in life 
and you look for correlations between those experiences in their youth and their views later on in life. And what you see is quite striking. If you experienced a recession uh, in your youth, you are more positive towards redistribution. Um, you are more likely to support um, if, intervention of the state and you are more suspect of free market. Moreover, if you, the same is true if you lived through a recession during your formative years or if you lived through an epidemic. That increases um, your support for the state playing a greater role in the economy. So if you believe these studies, that means that public support for the state playing a greater role will increase. Now, it is a little known fact that support for democracy is greater than support for, public, for private ownership. So again, working with the same surveys, if we ask people, is it important to live in a democracy? Three quarters of people will say yes. Uh, this is the vertical axis. The only country that's an outlier there below, it's Lebanon, but that's a country that has lived through very turbulent times. If you ask people, are you in favor of greater role of private ownership? Uh, the answers are much more mixed and they range between you know, one third and probably two thirds. Only a few countries such as Japan, US um, and uh, Switzerland are, are much more predisposed positively to private ownership. If you're wondering where Sweden, Sweden is up there in that red, um, red circle. Now, why does it all matter, right? It matters because state-owned enterprises are not governed perfectly, to put it mildly, in emerging markets. So OECD has guidelines on best practice when it comes to running state-owned enterprises. And what my colleagues at EBRD did is we looked at countries where we operate and we asked what percentage of those countries actually complies with those guidelines. And the picture is far from pretty. So in about half of the countries, there is no distinction between ownership of, a, of an enterprise in the sector and regulation, right? So an SOE is a rule maker. They are setting the rules for the sector where they operate. In quite a few, actually in 80% of countries, appointments to the boards of those enterprises are not based on merit. They are not transparent. They are open to political abuse, to the ruling party, putting their friends in those positions. And in most countries, there are no rules that would prevent financial support being given to state-owned enterprises uh, and such financial support that giving financial support that could undermine private sector, that could lead to unfair competition. So here, what we mean is um, lending at concessionary terms, preferential treatment when it comes to taxes, um, access, to uh, utilities at preferred rate. Now, what it all means is that with the expansion of the state sector, particularly in emerging markets, we can tilt the playing field against the private sector. And this has, obviously it has implications for growth. You know, there's a, there are decades of the literature showing that state-owned enterprises are less efficient, less productive, less innovative. But it also matters at other levels. It has implications for politics. If, if the state sector expands, there are more jobs to be given to political friends and political allies. It becomes possible to use state enterprises to buy media outlets to ensure that they become propaganda machines for the ruling elites. And that's going to, that's going to entrench the political parties in power, and that may undermine democracy. Finally, this has implications for globalization. You know, one of the issues we've been struggling at the WTO is state subsidies. Because 
And a lot of people think of this issue as being only related to China, because, you know, when China entered WTO in 2001, um, nobody worried about the issue of state-owned enterprises because everybody thought, well, you know, they would go away just like disco disappeared, right? Um, because the world was moving in that one particular direction. That has not happened. And the WTO rules are actually not very good at dealing with that. Um, and now, and now it's not just an issue of China, it's issue of other emerging markets. Moreover, we have not quite seen the fallout from the pandemic yet. If you look at number of bankruptcies um, in the European Union, so the advanced EU is in green, um, new EU member states are in red, and COVID beginning of the pandemic is the vertical line. You, look, you see that, for instance, in emerging Europe, number of bankruptcies during COVID was lower than prior to COVID. And that's because many governments have introduced emergency measures that protect firms from creditors. Now, I don't want to dispute whether or not these measures were warranted, but what this means is that we haven't seen the fallout from the pandemic yet. Right? That we are going to see more bankruptcies taking place as these measures are phased out and as economic growth is slowing down. But who is going to have a higher chance of surviving? It's the state-owned enterprises, right? So the landscape may be changing. Okay, so that was the state sector, right? The second theme I would like to talk about is reshuffling of global value chains. Now, as a trade economist, I've been asked about global value chains since the beginning of the pandemic, and I kept on saying, well, you know, we are going to see changes, and the changes have not been happening, right? We haven't seen them. But this time is different, right? So why is this time different? Well, I think by now, everybody recognizes that supply chain disruptions are not going away. So just to remind you some of the disruptions we had. There was the Fukushima disaster, which meant that Japanese plants operating in the US were not getting access to their inputs from Japan. Then there was China-US trade war, which is still continuing. There was obviously COVID. Um, there was blockage of the Suez Canal. Um, there are all the extreme weather events. And if we believe scientists, many more may be coming, their frequency may be increasing as climate change progresses. And now parts of China where the zero COVID policy persists are in lockdown, right? Which puts, which creates further disruptions to um, global value chains. And I'm not even talking about shortage of truck drivers in the US or in the UK or labor union negotiations in the US West Coast ports which are going to disrupt shipping this summer. Right? On top of all of these disruptions, um, we have the war. And this war matters. And this war has already been felt all across the world. Okay? So let's start with a very basic uh, statistic. Prices of wheat. Ukraine and Russia export 30% of global trade in wheat. Um, if you look at where wheat is produced in Ukraine, it's produced in the parts of Ukraine which are now under, uh, under occupation where the war is at its most intense. Price of wheat in inflation adjusted terms today is where we last saw it in 2008. Um, and in 2008, this was right the, during the financial crisis, there was a domino effect of countries introducing export restrictions, artificially creating shortages, and increasing, leading to a price spike. The price today is where it was back then. And back then, there were riots in 40 countries because of high food prices, right? And, you know, there is a real danger that there will be a repeat of export restrictions, which will further increase um, prices. And, you know, this is not just wheat. You know, very few people know that Ukraine is one of the 
top four exporters of corn, along with uh, Brazil and Argentina. So it, it's, it's a large exporter of edible oils. Uh, so agricultural markets are feeling this. Now, who is feeling this the most? North Africa and Middle East. I mean, these, um, these figures are probably too small for you to read, but basically what you see here is that countries like Libya, Lebanon, Tunisia, Egypt, um, uh, Turkey, Yemen, these are countries which import a lot of wheat from, I think on this graph from Ukraine, they import, the region imports a lot of wheat from Russia. Now, of course, Wheat is a commodity, you can buy it from somewhere else. But what matters is the high price. And if you are going to import wheat from another place, from a place that's further away, high fuel prices will mean high transportation costs as well. So these countries are already feeling high prices of wheat. And that puts governments in a somewhat uncomfortable situation where they are under pressure to continue with subsidies, to increase subsidies in order to avoid um, political instability. And they are forced to do that in a situation where public finances are already strained because of COVID, because during COVID times, every government um, got highly indebted. Right? And they are also forced they are also under pressure to do this in a situation where borrowing in international markets has become more expensive. Now, some of these countries, and you know, again, I apologize, this is probably too hard to read. The red part of the graph shows countries' short-term external liabilities. So this is your trade deficit. This is you know, the, the external debt that you need to pay off within the year. Right? And it compares it to your foreign reserves. And if you are in this red shaded area, um, that shows that you have external reserves that can cover less than a year of your reliabilities. Now, what happens with higher prices um, is that your trade deficit uh, expands, right? Because many of these countries are net importers of energy, which is more expensive, and they are net importers of food. So their trade deficit widens, but and they find themselves in a situation um, of external uh, vulnerability, right? They are vulnerable to a balance of payment crisis. So, you know, here we are talking about Jordan, Tunisia, Turkey. Um, so that's not a very comfortable situation to be in. And it is also, just to be provocative, not inconceivable that some governments will react to high food prices with oppression, with repressing people. So it's political instability that may bring in um, even aggressive or forced response from autocratic governments. OK, now there are other pressure points. Um, Belarus, Ukraine, Russia are important exporters of fertilizer inputs, right? So potash and ammonia. Um, now, so they export between, you know, a quarter and, and, and actually 40% of those inputs. Now, what that means is that prices of fertilizers have gone up. Now, also to produce fertilizers, you need natural gas, high prices, prices going up. That means... Um, that globally we are fertilizers are going to be more expensive, fewer will be used, and that's going to affect harvest this year, right? In many places. And poorer harvest this year will mean higher prices of food going into next year. Right? So you already see that if this war ended today, its repercussions are going to be felt well into the next year. Okay, um, metals, other pressure points. Um, you know, Russia and Belarus export things like enriched uranium, needed for nuclear plants, um, titanium, needed for space and uh, space industry, palladium, which is needed for catalytic converters in cars with combustion 
engines, um, aluminum or aluminum tins, um, quite a range of, of metals. And this is yet another pressure point. Some of those substances are also needed for semiconductor industry. At the moment, semiconductor industry has stockpiles, but these stockpiles are not huge. So we may, in a few months, we may see pressures um, working through the semiconductor industry. Okay. Now, the direct impact um, of the war through access to, to Russian market, that's actually relatively small. Relatively few countries and mostly countries in the region are dependent on exports to Russia. A more um, interesting perhaps channel is reliance on some countries in the region on Russia as a transit route for their exports. So places like Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, they rely on shipping goods through Russia. They rely on Russian transport, logistics, and banks um, to ship their goods out. You know, Tajikistan is one of the countries which uses Russian banks for foreign exchange transactions. Given the sanctions, now they have a problem because they cannot access um, foreign exchange. So there will be also rerouting of exports. You know, these countries will need to ship their exports um, differently than through Russia. So why do I think that now things are changing? In May already, in an IFO survey, which asked German firms, do you plan to diversify your suppliers? 30% uh, of German firms said yes. So 30% basically was thought that di diversification is something they should be doing. 30% thought, well, you know, they need to increase stockpiling, they need to increase inventories, and um, they need to monitor their supply chains uh, more closely. However, what you also see that the answers differed depend on whether firms themselves experience disruptions. And what I would argue is that because now there's yet, there's yet another shock, another disruption, that's going to push firms into changing their, their suppliers. And this is, to put one silver lining here, this is an opportunity for some emerging markets. So if you think about, you know, take the European perspective, and here on this graph, on the horizontal axis, you see German imports from China as a share of total German imports of a particular product. And on vertical axis, you see whether a given country in the broadly defined European neighborhood has comparative advantage in producing the same product. And you see that quite a few countries um, in Eastern Europe, in the Balkans, or in North Africa are producing and exporting the same products that China supplies to Europe. So there is actually a potential for shortening of, of global value chains and for bringing more business to those countries, which for many of them would be a great opportunity uh, to capture a higher share of, of global trade. Okay, moving on. Um, Another area that's worth thinking about is the interplay between war, climate change policies, and global value chains. And this is, um, so let's start with a very basic fact, as I'm sure all of you know, in Europe, prices of natural gas are at record high, right? Um, this obviously will have impact on, on, on European competitiveness, because if you see this, this faint gray line depicts natural gas prices in the US. Those they haven't, those though, though, their prices have not moved, right? Because prices of natural gas are regional, because you can't just buy gas easily from wherever you want. You need infrastructure. You either need a pipeline or you need an infrastructure to accept shipments of liquefied natural gas. In contrast, oil prices are high, but they are not at the historical peak. And, um, you know, these are global markets that affects everybody equally. You know, 
there are many implications for inflation, for growth, but we are talking about globalization. So let me uh, put these issues aside. Now, um, in Europe, and this is very relevant to the discussions, even this morning, you may have read about new sanctions being considered, um, to new sanctions being considered by the EU um, to be imposed on Russia. And these are sanctions um, on hydrocarbons. Uh, why is it not easy to make such a decision? Because if you see on, on this graph, on the right-hand side graph, some countries are actually completely dependent on imports of Russian gas. So 100% of their natural gas imports come from Russia. Now, Europe has been very good at increasing uh, imports of liquefied natural gas, right? But um, you know, you cannot completely uh, make up uh, with liquefied natural gas for what the Europe purchases from Russia at the moment. Um, and remember, this summer or this autumn, Europe entered the heating season with storage tanks for natural gas having a, a low fill rate by historical standards. So the, the gray shaded area shows you where typically fill rate would be in a given month. And the line, the dark line below shows you where it is, where it was this year. So, so we are, the heating season is, is over, right? It's almost over. Well, maybe not here with the snow falling, right? But it's, but you know we are managing and in the short run europe will manage the question is how are you going to fill these tanks over the summer and you know there's a lot of work being done by the commission to bring liquefied natural gas um, but remember this also may have spillover effects because if you buy think if you bring liquefied natural gas you know, this market is not infinite. It's very hard to increase export capacity in the short run because you need facilities. And these facilities, these terminals need a few years um, to be built, right? To, to be able to export. So if Europe buys more, somebody else is going to, to get less. Now, what does this mean? That means that this may encourage some emerging markets to rely on other fuels, right? So why in Europe, the war will increase our impetus towards a green transition. I think we are going to see increase in uh, renewable energy investment. The question is what will our other countries do, right? Countries outside of Europe in a situation where, you know, coal is suddenly becoming cheaper uh, relative, relative to gas. Um, now, there is another pressure point here when it comes to renewables. This is access to metals that are exported by Belarus and, um, and Russia. But here, let's focus on Russia. Chromium, titanium, palladium are needed uh, for the renewable energy sector. Nickel is needed for, for batteries. So you know, depending how things play out, we are, we may be seeing higher prices here. You already see where these prices are relative to a five-year average inflation adjusted. They are sometimes doubled, um, but there could also be, be shortages. So it's, there are, you know, the, the shock is a great impetus towards green transition but it's not trivial given this, these pressure points. Now, Europe has made, so now sort of moving on, abstracting from the shock, let's think about what European policy will mean for trade. So Europe has made very ambitious commitments um, to green transition. Europe is very determined to lead the world in terms of these commitments. Now, in order, um, for these commitments to be capped, um, a carbon border adjustment mechanism has been proposed. What's, what's the idea here? The idea is to avoid carbon leakage 
if you have high carbon prices at home, you don't want all the production to move somewhere else because that would defeat the purpose, right? Because the emissions would be just happening somewhere else. Also, you want to make sure that uh, you don't put your own producers out of business, right? And you also want to create a sense of fairness. So this is the idea behind carbon border adjustment tax. So imports that are coming from another place where there are no carbon taxes um, would be subject to an extra payment and this payment would depend on where countries are uh, in terms of carbon intensity of production of a given product and carbon um, taxation. So um, what does it mean, right? So first, if you think about European countries, so EU member states, we have some states like unfortunately Poland, um, but also Czech Republic, um, Bulgaria, Romania, where still a considerable share of electricity production comes from coal, right? And that's why, you know, these discussions today about sanction on Russian coal are going to be difficult um, for, for these countries. So these countries, in the presence of higher carbon prices, will be struggling with their competitiveness. And, you know, so far, their growth model has been um, based on being manufacturing based for Europe. Typically, they have higher share of manufacturing in GDP than other countries with the same level of income. This is going to be a challenge. Now, what about countries outside of, of the EU, countries that would be potentially to this carbon border adjustment mechanism? You see that there is quite a range of of CO2 intensity when it comes to production of steel, steel being one of the six um, sectors that would be subject to the tax. So for instance, um, Turkey, in Turkey, carbon intensity is about 150% of the EU average. In you know, Kazakhstan, it's twice. But then you have Tunisia and Morocco, where actually, thanks to green energy, renewable energy, their carbon intensity is lower. So this already tells you that this tax may lead to changes in trade patterns because it can make some countries uh, non-competitive as producers of particular, of, of particular goods that are subject to this. Of course, the hope is that because this tax is delayed, right? It's not going to be introduced immediately. It's going to create incentives for exporters in those countries to push their own governments to introduce carbon prices because exporters want that because that would allow them to compete with domestic producers um, who would be subject to the same rules. Otherwise, they may be disadvantaged. Okay. Um, at this point, you may ask a question, well, you know, why aren't developing countries simply investing in, in green, in renewables? You know, what, what is holding them back? So that's something um, we looked at at the EBRD. And, and we looked at, you know, we did survey of 20,000 firms across countries where we operate, and we asked them whether they are engaged in green management. Is there somebody responsible for green issues? You know, do they have a policy? And we ask, um, and we then try to see the patterns. You know, what kind of firms are more green aware? And what you see is that it's larger and older firms are much more likely to be aware of environmental issues than younger firms, than smaller firms. But what's particularly striking is the difference between domestically owned firms and foreign firms. It's really the foreign firms that are at the forefront of the green policies. Similarly, if you split firms by those that are domestic market oriented and export oriented, it's really the export oriented firms. And if you ask firms, you know, what have you invested in something green, so this is maybe green energy generation, recycling, minimization of waste, you see that firms invest either if they are subject to pressure from their customers or if there are taxes. Now, this is my favorite graph, and this is a graph that absolutely shocked me. 
we asked firms, if you have not invested in green, in in, in you know energy efficiency actually this question was was very uh, specific in energy in improving energy efficiency why is that and the shocking answer was that 60 60 percent of firms said simply not a priority for us right the lack of financial resources was a distant second so what this is telling us that you know in many emerging market there is lack of awareness. Firms simply don't see the benefit, the need, the urgency of undergoing, um, of, un of investing in green issues. So there is a lot of work to be done in terms of providing that information. And here I would argue that foreign direct investment can help it can speed up green transition. How? Well, first of all, you saw that foreign firms are much more aware, attuned to these issues. They are under pressure from their customers in rich countries. Um, they worry about because of reputation reasons, but also they have access to newer technologies. They are more efficient. They are better managed. So simply, if you are more efficient, if you produce um, the same amount with fewer resources, you are immediately um, less your emissions are lower, you're less emission intensive. Now, I've actually looked at this question in my own research, looking at Indonesian manufacturing establishment. And what is beautiful about Indonesian data is that you have information from the census of manufacturing exactly on the amount of various types of energy used by firms you know how much diesel how much kerosene how much electricity how much even firewood they use and that allows you to calculate the cost of energy it but it also allows you to calculate the uh, the energy content of all these fuels you can convert them into the common unit um, british thermal units and then you can see um, what if there are differences between foreign and domestic firm plants, right, in terms of energy intensity? And the question I was in particular interested in was what happens when a domestic producer is acquired by foreign owners? Does it do anything to this energy intensity? Now, of course, if you just do before and after comparison, it's not meaningful because ideally you would like to know how has this acquired firm, how it would have performed had it not been acquired, right? But this counterfactual is not an observable because the firm has been acquired. So what you can do is you can use a very simple trick for each plant that will be acquired next year, you find a twin. You find a control observation, a plant operating in the same industry, observed in the same year, similar in terms of size, in terms of energy intensity, but a plant that will remain in domestic hands, right? And then you have this control group, this and this treated group, the, the plants that are acquired, and then you look at how their trajectories diverge over time. Now, when you do that, and well, first thing you can check that these two groups are no different in terms of characteristics such as energy intensity, such as size, such as uh, growth, um, e and, and so on. And then what you can see is look at how their path diverge. And what you see, for instance, here you can compare energy expenditure over value of output. You see that prior to ownership change, so prior to this, um, to this T point year of acquisition, the future acquisition targets and the plants that will remain in Indonesian hands forever, they are on the same path. But then their path diverge once ownership change happens. The red plants, the domestic plants, continue increasing their energy intensity while plants acquired by foreign interests become more energy efficient. Now, you may say, well, you know, spending is not a great proxy, so you can, re you can repeat the same exercise in terms of British thermal units of energy use relative to output size. And you see 
red plants, domestic plants on continue on their trajectory, why plants acquired by foreign interest become much more efficient when it comes to energy intensity and you can convert that into CO2 emission intensity, same message. So foreign direct investment can help by bringing better technology, improving productivity, bringing knowledge can increase, um, improve performance, lower CO2 emissions. Um, finally, in the last four minutes, let me say a few words about digitalization. So digitalization, creates new opportunities. I already mentioned to you um, that working from home, right, may uh, create export opportunities, right? If it's now standard that remote work is acceptable, it's something that's doable, workers don't need to be in the same city, they don't even need to be in the same country. Now you can imagine a situation where somebody works in Gothenburg, but you know, they are really living in Romania, right? And you know, once in a blue moon, they show up in the office to, to talk to colleagues. And of course there are limitations, right? It's easier to do so if you're in the same time zone, it's easier to do so if it, there are no restrictions on travel and if data, if you are living under the same data protection regime. So that shows that this should be easier within the European Union because often transfers of data are involved and in some sectors there are very strict rules when it comes to, to movement of data. So this may be an opportunity for new EU member states, for poorer EU member states to export services to the richer one. So, and this is an opportunity for firms in richer EU member states to cut costs. But it may not benefit everybody equally, right? So what we worry about at the EBRD is huge differences in country, across countries uh, in their sophistication when it comes to digitalization. You know, here you see a map which shows broadband subscriptions relative to population size. You see Sweden is very dark, you know, just like Western Europe. But the further east and south you go, the lighter the color gets, indicating much lower penetration of, of broadband. And of course, you can't engage in exports of services unless you have reliable connection. Now, another way of measuring um, progress of digitalization is to look at the share of the population that shops online. So 90% of Brits purchased something online last year. If you look at, and you know, Sweden is actually very similar. It's about, you know, it's, it's between 80 and 90%. Um, if you look at Poland, Czech Republic, it's, you know, between half and, and two thirds. But if you, Think about Western Balkans, Macedonia, uh, Macedonia, Bulgaria. This is about um, thirty percent, right? These countries, huge differences. And you know, I I don't want to take a stand on whether shopping online is a good or a bad thing. I think of this measure as an indicator for penetration of digitalization. Now, so you may ask why. So we were interested in this question, why so few people buy online? And we thought the problem was payment security. People were worried that, you know, they pay for something, they will never get the goods. But actually that's not true because in many countries you can pay on delivery. So the risk is limited, you know, you pay when you get a package. What it turned out was it was lack of skills people reported that they don't know how to do this. And that was that matter more than their concern about payment security. So now let me disaggregate these dots and show you differences across various types of people when it comes to online shopping. So the first big difference is related to income quarter. Now the dark lines are showing um, emerging Europe, the gray line shows old EU member states. Right? So what do you see that it's true both 
in the West and in the East that people who have higher income are much more likely to shop online, but the differences are starker in emerging markets. What you also see is a big difference between people living in cities and people living in the countryside. You see big differences in uh, when it comes to education. And again, the line is steeper for Eastern Europe. And here we also have data for um, Western Balkans and Turkey. But the part that worries me the most are differences by age. And in particular here, you see that people who are 55 years of age and older, they are much less likely to possess digital skills if they are in emerging market in Western Balkans, in Turkey, than if they are in advanced EU. And that means that as digitalization progresses, they actually may be pushed out of the labor market and they will not be able to take advantage of the, of the opportunities, including opportunities for exports of services that are offered by digitalization. So let me close with a few questions rather in conclusions. Some food for thought, right? We talked a lot during the pandemic about big tech firms and multinational firms emerging as winners. I would like to pose that state-owned enterprises will also emerge as winners from the pandemic. And that may have implications for international trade and international trade rules. Um, I think it is not inconceivable that this reorganization of global value chains will go, will lead to something called French shoring, meaning you move production facilities to countries that are aligned with you politically. And that it's not inconceivable that this is going to create trade that's much more regional and that's going to divide the world along geopolitical lines. On a positive note, I wonder whether green credentials will become a source of competitive advantage and whether green credentials will determine where now production will be located because of European green policies, but also because of pressure from consumers, including consumers like you. And finally, I wonder whether we are going to see more exports of services from emerging markets. So thank you for your attention. Let me stop here. Lots for this very nice uh, lecture. So my name is Ola Olsson. I will be uh, the um, person leading the uh, discussion now with questions from the floor as well as from uh, the Zoom uh, online format. So, so please, if you have questions, uh, just uh, raise your hand and uh, and uh, indicate to me if you're interested, and then you will be handed the microphone. So I, I'll just start by by a question. You you mentioned uh, potentially the need to shorten supply chains in many goods, also the need to uh, maybe substitute uh, goods produced in Russia and Ukraine in a short sense, in a, in a, in the short term, and in, also in the longer term. Uh, we know that there's a huge de increase in demand for certain minerals, for instance, those that are needed for electrification. Um, but what you didn't talk so much about is that uh, how easy is it actually for some of the developed countries in Europe, for instance, to, to step up in this production? We know from, from several countries that there seems to be a bit of a political resistance, uh, local resistance, and in other ways towards these mining activities that seems to be necessary. Uh, how, how would you see that as a constraint to the electrification? Uh, that we're uh, facing, uh, that, that we need to go through in the in the next few years. So these are very hard questions, but but let me be a bit precise here, right? I don't think that shortening of supply chains is a goal in itself, mm. right? It is what matters is resilience, meaning diversification of input sources, right? So if you bring all of the production from China to Sweden, that doesn't solve your problem because 
you may have you know flooding in sweden right you may have some sort of natural disaster which will create problems so what you want is to have more than one source of supply and that doesn't necessarily mean shortening now we also need to distinguish between global value chains and supply of minerals so we've seen actually ukraine and russia are not particularly well integrated in global value chains so we've seen um, after the war started some car manufacturing having to stop production because Ukraine produces cables, so-called electric harnesses for cars. And that has affected production in uh, particular in, in Eastern Europe. Um, so that problem can be solved, right, with diversification. Now, the problem of minerals is, is just simply much harder, simply because some minerals, you know, the deposits are concentrated, mm. right? And that's um that's not that's not easy hmm. and you know as to you know how to um deal with resilience you know the, the the question of dealing with resistance from local population whether to mining activities or to new windmills hmm. uh, sorry to new renewable and wind farms hmm. right i think here what matters is a process that's faster hmm. right because that's that's what is diff you know obviously in a democracy you want local people to have a say but you want the process to be completed within a reasonable timeline regardless of the outcomes and hmm. i think in some places it's this length of the process that makes such investments unattractive yes thank you Okay, any questions from the floor? Otherwise, I'll give the word to Jan over there. Is there, a, I think there is a question. Oh, there was one, I, I didn't see it. No. Well, just, just wait for the, the mic. I just want to ask how the mechanisms of corruption figure into the research and and how that is how you're able to square the circle of uh, the uh, corruption between say the media and the pharmaceutical industry for example in america and and how that is actually had a, a <clears throat> substantive effect on people in third world countries by the you know the um unwillingness to uh, supply them with the necessary pharmaceuticals for COVID. Uh, so the mechanism of corruption, my question is then, how does that affect the research? Research in pharmaceutical industry? Or yes, in for the, you know, for the um, global um, economic situation. Okay. So 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 let me sort of unpack this question and, and and address it in several stages so first um you talk about corruption i would talk about lobbying power of multinationals right so so what we are talking about are campaign contributions large firms make um to policymakers or to future policymakers who stand for elections and here, you know, in my first bullet point, why it is problematic that SOEs and MNEs will emerge as winners from the pandemic, it is because both groups are rule makers. SOEs are rule makers because often there is no distinction between ownership and, and regulation in the sector. It's the same entity that has both powers, right? Why in Western countries, um, the economic power of firms, particularly large multinational con um, concerns, cons gives them political power and they can change political process. And, and this is, and the, you know, this is a huge issue that has been recognized uh, in the literature. Nobody quite knows how to um, deal with it in practice, right? And then you could say also multinationals, large corporations, um, big tech, 
they control, you know, they can invest a lot of money in advertising, right? Similarly, state-owned enterprises can be used by governments in corrupt countries to spit out their propaganda. So, so there, are, there are quite a few parallels. Now, when it comes to pharmaceutical research, there the issue is of incentives for R&D in investment, which is risky. Right. So if you are developing a new heart, heart disease drug, you have a huge market uh, in rich countries, you know, you are going to sell it very profitably. So even your very risky R&D effort is going to pay off. If you are going to invent a new malaria drug, you know that your potential patients are poor and they may not be able to afford it, right? But, but there's a solution. So the solution is by um, international community to guarantee a market to a firm that develops a drug. And, you know, that has been done. You can have a price for um, drugs that would treat poor country diseases. So basically the idea is that if somebody develops an effective drug, they get a price which is partial or full compensation, right? The price is set in advance for their R&D efforts. Okay, John. Yeah, we, we have a, uh, a few questions from our online audience. Um, one is uh, about the Black Sea. So given that, uh, from one of the participants, given that Black Sea is the important part of supply chain between Europe and Asia, what other alternatives do you think would Europe use in case Russia takes control of the Black Sea and blocks the supplies to Europe? And how much do you think this would affect European economy? So my understanding is that there is very little shipping happening via Black Sea. Um, and that's for two reasons. According to the US State Department, some commercial ships have been bombed by Russian forces, but it's also international shippers are unwilling to go there. Um, this is going to primarily affect exports of commodities, wheat, corn, right? I mentioned that uh, Ukraine exports 30%, I think, of global exports of corn. Um, the corn is exclusively shipped via Black Sea. Um, so it's not possible now to get these supplies out. Right. So so the you know, at the moment, everybody is worried about the planting season in Ukraine. Right. So farmers are affected by war, by the war, by military activities. There's also a shortage of fuel. But, you know, not being able to plant to sow seeds is one part of the issue. The second part is if you have harvest in the summer, will you be able to get it out to export? We have a question there. <clears throat> well, uh, talking about the developing world we had in the Cold War, we had a big fight between, say, the Soviet Union and the U.S., partly Europe, uh, influencing countries in, in say, Africa uh, on, on choosing side, more or less, with military aid and other, other things. Do you think that will intensify now? Because we have been through a period where mostly, uh, as it's as China has been active in, in tying these bonds to, to developing countries. Do you think there will be a new phase now with also the Western world, uh, now in, in the sense of uh, friend uh, shoring? I think it is not inconceivable that this is exactly what would happen, right? That the world, you know, under the Cold War, right? We had Western world, we had Comecon, right? The former um, Soviet Union and satellite states, and then we had some non-aligned countries. And it's not inconceivable that we are heading towards a situation where there will be such blocks emerging and that actually would lead to globalization being being rolled back thank you is it on yeah so uh, thank you my name is gunnar shalin and this is a fantastic lecture thank you so much uh, 
uh, I'm going to zoom in on, on one of your lines there, the divergence uh, divergence of supply chains along climate policy lines. And well, yesterday, new IPCC report, I mean, the, we need to act faster than ever, and everybody is aware of, of the need for this incredibly fast uh, green transition all over the world, and not least in, in the in the global south and since this is a development talk i, I was so impressed by by your your graph of uh, how foreign direct investment could actually make a difference so that could be one mechanism and you talked a little bit about the the cbam about the carbon uh, uh, border price adjustment mechanism uh, so if we are to be serious about this green transition and there are all these fears of of um, to to increase trade because of, of all these challenges what could be the the policy mechanisms here for europe uh to to do the right thing because we don't want to to delink or kind of we, we don't want to uh stop our trade with the global south and, and we don't want them to to not thrive uh, from that but we want to do it in, in a sustainable way so how can we get have this green transition post COVID that everyone is wishing for and we don't really see? Well, I, I think to you know to some extent it is happening, right? Because carbon border adjustment mechanism is creating very powerful incentives, right? That there is an incentive um, to become less carbon intensive if you want to export to Europe and remain competitive. But of course, you know, it's not trivial to accomplish that. So you need investment from Europe, from the world, including from institutions like EBRD. You know, we are heavily involved in financing um, solar farms, wind farms. But, you know, you need more. And actually, sometimes I feel what matters more is not our investment but it's our policy dialogue with the countries so that we unblock investment possibilities for the private sector. Because I think there's enormous appetite on behalf in the private sector to invest in green uh, issues, in green areas, right? In green industry, in renewables, but it's difficult to do it in practice. So institutions like ours, through dialogue with governments, help create the legal infrastructure that allows such investment takes place. Because often, you know, there is the sort of the less glorious part, the regulation on feed-in tariffs, the regulation on, you know, land use, um, and so on and so forth. And the main benefit of this is that then when we invest, we sent a signal to the private sector that this is a reasonable opportunity, right? Because, you know, we are lending, we are not giving grants, we want our money back. So that signals to the private sector that they most likely will not lose their money. And our investments serves as a seal of approval that then crowds in private investment. And I think this mobile, so it's, so what you need is three things. One is policy dialogue, so un unlocking opportunities. And second, you need investment that will crowd in private financing. Oh, these are private financing. But of course, you need incentives, right? And, and I think that's why CBAM is a good thing, because CBAM creates support for green policies within Europe. Now, remember, we need to make sure that we take public with us when we talk about green transition and and you know and this is becoming difficult in a situation where we are facing very high energy prices in europe right and cbam creates a sense of fairness of lay level playing field at the same time creates incentives and you know and i would argue that perhaps the biggest impact of cbam is now even before it kicks in because it it actually focuses minds of policymakers in emerging countries uh, there and then there thank you very much very interesting so could one say there is almost a kind of a paradox 
because we at the one hand side we would like to increase foreign direct investments in order to change towards a green transition faster in especially maybe the third world or whatever i should call it in poor countries and at the same time we are reduce or we are afraid of having this kind of uh, supply chain and globalization um, reduction if you understand what i mean so we have one force that is showing we should have more of investments abroad and on the other hand we should have be more afraid of doing that because we have a problem uh, so my answer is no there yep. is no tension because see we are not afraid of having those investments it's just the fact that there have been these shocks and then these shocks are likely to continue because of geopolitical tensions and because of climate leading to extreme weather events we need to um, increase resilience of global value chains which means source the same thing from more than one location right so it's not that globalization is bad because if you put all of your production at home in one location, you have the same problem. You have no diversification. And I think this is the, the fallacy. You know, what some countries were doing early in the pandemic, they were trying to create incentives for reshoring, even giving financial incentives. But reshoring does nothing for uh, resilience, right? Developed countries are also subject to shocks. So I actually see no tension. Arne and then John. Uh, I have a question about the first point, your privatization to uh, oh, yes. state firms going private. Of course, in the, in the Soviet Union, for example, or in Russia, though, Belarus and other places, privatization meant that some oligarchs took control of it. And they've been in the spotlight now lately. So my question is whether it's going to be some special treatment for oligarch multinationals in the future, or if they say the Russian oligarch controlled multinationals will be able to make a comeback even post Putin. Well, that's a million dollar question. Now, I, I, I haven't showed you, I had a graph showing nickel prices uh, and nickel prices, nickel, vital for batteries, right? They are very high. Um, and they are not just high because of, you know, supplies were low already in 2019, because, you know, we have tensions, we have the war, but also because nickel is uh, linked to oligarchs, right? Companies owned, I think, uh, by oligarchs are exporting nickel. And markets have been pricing in sanctions. So um, is it a good time to become oligarch? <laughs> I, I would say no, right? Do a PhD, don't become an oligarch, because I, I would hope that the future will become harder for you if you, if you become an oligarch. Yeah. Two, uh, two questions uh, related to the environmental impact and, uh, and green growth. So one is on uh, the, uh, with the increased uh, demand for online shopping, uh, can it increase also the environmental impacts uh, as a result of higher carbon emissions? So transport of an individual, uh, for an individual versus aggregate transport for a business. Uh, what's, uh, what would be the solution to prevent uh, the future high impact, environmental impact, while enjoying the benefits of it? And the second one on uh, uh, the multinationals versus the smaller, uh, smaller business. Should the new green growth pattern uh, look again into dependency of bigger uh, multinationals or should the pattern rather look into more support, uh, supporting diversification of local smaller business uh, production of sustainable goods? Okay, so excellent questions. On the shopping online versus uh, retail shopping, um, I'm not sure it's obvious that online shopping is environmentally worse, but you know, I, 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 I'm just hypothesizing here, right? I haven't seen exact studies because remember, if you are shopping in a store, you have a store which uses electricity, employees have to get there, customers have to get there. Um, 
if you are shopping online, you don't necessarily need to get goods to your home. You know, there are these pickup points, right? And if the volume is sufficient, um, that's actually, there, there are some efficiencies there. Um, so I am less con concerned about that. On support for big versus small firms, I mean, I think there is room for everybody. And in a sense, you know, many countries run support for SMEs. I guess the difference is that it's much easier for a large enterprise to become green simply because often becoming green means investing in new technology, um, in new way of doing things, a new type of products, in, in marketing the new product you have. And if you are large, you know, it, we see there's a very strong correlation between size, productivity, and profitability in private enterprises, right? So if so, you have enough profits to cover this investment. If you are small firms, it's much harder for you um, to shell out the money that's needed. Also, um, there is a very sort of simple way of thinking about this. If, you, if your investment is a fixed cost, right? So it's, it's an amount that's not related to the number of units you produced. If you are a small firm, you supply a very small market, then the cost of investment per unit sold is high. While if you are a large firm reaching many markets, your per unit cost is small. So that's why it's much more likely that big firms uh, are going to invest. And that's why small firms may need help. Yes, I think we're unfortunately running out of uh, time. Uh, so this has been a fantastic uh, lecture for very nice questions from the audience. Uh, and Par will have a final uh, word here and potentially provide a gift. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you very much, Beata, for coming here and bringing us a cap talk. And I really hope, Jan and uh, Katharina, that this will not be the last cap talk here in Gothenburg. But this seminar here today, this cap talk has certainly been enlightening because it's right in the center of gravity of the development we are in the midst of right now. And of course, in a situation where we are leaving a pandemic, and at the same time, we have a new report from the UN uh, Climate Panel, we have, which is certainly quite dystopic, even if it leaves us with some hope. And at the same time, the impossible or the incomprehensible happened that we have a major war in Europe. I think it's very important that the academia take its responsibility here. If anywhere in society it should be possible to discuss difficult questions that are complex, but let us accept that they are complex and there are no simple answers to complex questions. And moreover, when we have a situation in society where the demarcation line between opinions and statement of facts is becoming blurred. This kind of discussions are incredibly important. So thank you very much, Piata. And as a small token of our appreciation, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. And it was a pleasure to discuss these issues with you. Thank you all.